So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for our fourth webinar in the Publishing Best Practices series. My name is Nargiza Ludgate. Uh, this series is presented by the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Livestock Systems and the University of Florida Libraries. Today's webinar is dedicated to being accessible, is open access publishing right for me. In this session, we will discuss uh, best practices in publishing research, highlighting the usefulness of discipline-specific reporting standards to facilitate scholarly publishing. Next slide, please. I will now introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Terry Kidd Self. Uh, she is an experienced clinical investigator with specific expertise in the planning and execution of clinical trials involving mind-body therapies for chronic conditions related to aging and stress. She received a Doctor of Chiropractic degree from Palmer College of Chiropractic and a PhD in Educational Research from the University of Virginia. She also completed um, an NIH-funded postdoctoral fellowship in clinical research at the University of Virginia's Center for the Study of Complementary and Alternative Therapies. Dr. Sell's research background serves her well in her current position as a translational research and impact librarian at the University of, Fly of Florida. Before we start, let me share a few housekeeping uh, points. Um, this webinar will go for about an hour. Uh, please keep your microphones mute during Dr. Sell's presentation. You are welcome to write your name, institution you are from, um, as well as your title in the chat box. The recordings of these and other webinars in this series will be available soon in the Livestock Labs website. I will shortly drop the link in the chat box. Um, I will also drop the PowerPoint slides in French. Um, in the chat box so you can follow this presentation in French. And apologies that I did not start the captions in French and let me do that now. Just a second, please. It's uh, not letting me to do that. Just a second, please. Sorry for this. Okay, let me get uh, done with uh, the... with the housekeeping and then I will work on uh, activating the caption so you can follow this uh, presentation in French. Um, at the very end of Dr. Sell's presentation, we will have a Q&A session. Uh, therefore, please write your questions and comment in the chat, which we will address um, at the end. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Self to proceed with the presentation. Um, and Terry, if you could give me just a second to activate the, the captions. Has it been activated? Can you say something? Sure. Is it being translated? I didn't see anything pop up saying anything about captions, but oh, something. Yeah, it's yep. uh, working now. Okay, perfect. Uh, please proceed with your presentation. And I apologize for this technical uh, oversight on our side. All right, so as Nargiza said, I'm uh, Dr. Terry Self, just on camera to say hello. Um, and if you ever need to put a uh, face to the name, you can do that. I am going to turn off the camera though, as I go through the slides, as I just find it too distracting. Um, Today, we're going to be discussing open access journals, the types of 
open access articles and the pros and cons of open access publishing. And we will get right into it. There's a directory of open access journals, uh, also known as DOAJ, uh, which is a freely available index of open access journals that includes over 20,000 journals from over 100 countries. To be listed in DOAJ, Journals have to meet certain criteria. The first thing they mention is that journals should adhere to the principles and best practice in scholarly publishing, um, <clears throat> which may sound familiar. Uh, we have discussed that in previous sessions. They also say uh, the journal has to have been publishing for more than one year and have at least 10 open access research articles published and that established journals must publish at least five research articles per year and that researchers or practitioners must be the journal's primary audience. DOAJ defines what they mean by open access, stating that the full text of all content must be available for free with no requirement to register to read the content and no embargo period. And that means the article has to be made available immediately upon publication with no waiting period. Fully open access journals are different than traditional subscription-based journals where the content is only accessible to readers who have a subscription to the journal or are affiliated with an institution that subscribes to the journal. Here in fully OA journals, readers have access to all the content without uh, any limitation. DOAJ lists the information the journal needs to provide on their website. And much of this is familiar from the, the COPE principles of transparency that we've discussed in the past. The journal has to display their international standard serial number that is registered at issn.org. This is also in agreement with the, the COPE principles and we'll, we'll come back to this point later when we touch on predatory journals. In addition to an ISSN, the journal also needs to have a quality control process that includes having an editorial board, a peer review process, that involves each article being reviewed by at least two independent reviewers. DOAJ also recommends use of a plagiarism checker, but they do not require it. They also have a section addressing additional criteria needed for special issues or other content that is curated by guest editors. A couple of years ago, over 200 articles were retracted and another 300 were under investigation when the publishers Elsevier and Springer Nature 
both of them well-regarded publishers, uh, discovered that fraudsters had posed as scientists and offered to serve as guest editors of special issues of reputable journals and then published low quality or fake papers. So special issues have come, to, come under more scrutiny. And I think uh, these, these specific criteria may be in response to that. Lastly, the OAJ addresses uh, licensing and copyright terms that are used for the published content in OA journals. So only journals meeting these criteria are eligible to be indexed in DOAJ. So if a journal is included in this list, you know that it's met these standards. The DOAJ index is searchable by keyword. In this example, I searched uh, the word livestock, and that resulted in 36 index journals, just to give you a, an idea of how many OA journals are available in, in a particular field. When we talk about open access, we're primarily referring to the fact that items are made available to readers without them having to pay for access. There are two main types of OA, uh, gold and green. Gold OA articles are made available immediately And the, so it's free to the reader, <laughs> um, but it usually requires that the author pay uh, a fee up front called an article publishing charge or APC. This fee is often waived for authors from low income countries. And we'll discuss that uh, a bit more uh, later. Gold OA is not limited to journals that are fully OA, like the, the journals index in DOAJ. There are some subscription-based journals that allow authors to pay to make an individual article open access in that journal. And those are known as hybrid journals. So just some, if, if you hear those terms, you'll have a better understanding of what, uh, what is meant. So as I say, in addition to gold OA, there's also green OA. Under this model, uh, the, the article is still free to readers, but here the, <clears throat> the author does not have to pay an APC to make the uh, publisher's version available to everyone for free. The, the author can usually make their final approved version of the manuscript available in a repository. And that's known as self-archiving. The repository is sometimes uh, just their institutional repository or a subject repository. And sometimes a funding agency has a repository where any articles they funded have to be placed. And we'll look at an example of this in a bit. Under the green OA model, the publisher 
may impose an embargo period um, that's a set amount of time that the author needs to wait before they can make the, the item freely available. So always check to see what the journal allows if you're, if you're thinking about uh, publishing there. There's a resource called Sherpa Romeo that has information on the author self-archiving policies for a variety of journals. It can be really useful. In Sherpa Romeo, you can search by journal title or the ISSN of the journal or by a publisher. And here as an example, um, I'm searching for the journal Livestock Science. And notice as I start typing that in, it pops up some information of, uh, is, is this the one you're looking for? And it provides not only the journal title, but also the ISSN of the journal. Um, I'm pointing this out because sometimes journals have very similar titles and you'll need to know the ISSN of the journal you're looking for to make sure that uh, you identify the correct one. So here's the, the top of the record for the journal Livestock Science. It just gives the basic identifying information. And you can scroll down to see what the journal allows as far as um, making things open access. So this journal does allow the published version of the article to be used, but only under certain circumstances. In this case, it involves <clears throat> that the, the author had to pay uh, an extra fee to make the article itself open access. Same journal also has um, a green OA option, which does not require a fee. Here, if they use this, uh, this option, the author can post their accepted version of the manuscript in a repository, but they have to wait to make that version available um, for 12 months. So if you're publishing an article and you want to make it open access, be sure to look into what the journal allows before deciding to submit your article there. Not, it won't always be the case. Some journals will only have hmm, the gold OA option available. And if you did not pay they would not allow you to post any version of the article. So it's important to, to know in advance <laughs> what's going to be allowed. So why might someone choose to make their article open access? I think the biggest advantage is that open access articles are more accessible to more people. <laughs> so your work has broader reach and reaching more people can lead to increased citations. And that is a metric that is used to assess some researchers. Um, for those researchers, choosing an open access option might be particularly of interest. 
and now I just want to give a general idea of the prevalence of OA. Here I just looked at, at one database. This is uh, Dimensions. And it, it's got over 140 million publications. So I, I think this uh, can serve as a pretty good overview. So hmm, of all of the publications in the Dimensions database, uh, roughly 34% of them were open access publications. And looking at the mean citations for the open access publications, we see it is 14.5. That compares to the mean citations for publications that were not available open access uh, being 12.35. So OA in this case had slightly uh, more uh, mean citations than the non-OA. And then I looked uh, at publications related to livestock. And here, <clears throat> the open access came in at 40% of all of the, <clears throat> of the uh, publications available. The open access publications had a mean citation count of 18.22, which was slightly higher than the 16.5 citation mean for publications that were not open access. Again, this just gives a very rough impression of the prevalence of OA publications and the average number of citations they received in one particular database. <clears throat> the, the mean citation counts is going to vary by field. Um, it won't always necessarily be that articles published OA have uh, significantly more citations than those published non-OA, but I did think it was useful to kind of give you a, a, an overview. One thing, one thing I think can be said um, based on this information is that the number of open access publications related to livestock is growing each year. I expect that's a trend that will continue. Um, some funders actually mandate that articles resulting from the research they fund must be made freely available to the public. And as I mentioned, the, the National Institutes of Health in the US is one example of this. The idea is that Taxpayer dollars funded the research. So the results of that research should be made freely available to the public. In the case of NIH, publishing the research in an open access journal, you know, paying, paying the APCs, publishing in open access, that is not sufficient. They actually require that the final accepted peer reviewed manuscript, or it could be the publisher's PDF, um, either one has to be submitted to PubMed Central, their repository. And that, that way, even if something were to happen to the journal that published the article 
that was available there open access? Um, like if it were to cease publication, the NIH could ensure that at least the funded article would remain permanently available to the public. NIH is just one example of this. Many funding agencies have this type of a mandate. So be sure you know what your funder requires uh, and what you will need to do in order to be in compliance with their policy. Here's a resource that might be helpful in learning about existing mandates. It's the Registry of Open Access Repository Mandates and Policies, also known as ROARMAP. Uh, I'm not personally familiar with this resource, but I did take a quick look and included a couple of screenshots to give you a sense of whether it might be useful to you. So the registry contains 85 items. And I just clicked on uh, one of them, uh, the National Research Foundation of South Africa, to see an example of a record. Here you can see they do have a policy requiring peer-reviewed manuscripts to be made available. They allow the authors um, to use the final accepted version of the manuscript, and that can be deposited in their institutional repository. So these are the, the facts that you're going to want to know if you're going to be publishing research that was funded by this organization. So as you saw, some funders like NIH specify a particular repository that has to be used and others leave it to the author to find an appropriate repository for their research. This resource, OpenDOAR or Open Door, can help with that. If you have the name of a repository, like PubMed Central, uh, you can look that up in Open Door. and then get the record um, seeing what their open access policies are. If you don't have a repository in mind, you could browse by country to see what's available. And you'll see uh, the index of countries with the number of repositories for each. And I've highlighted a few that I thought might be of interest. And then actually uh, selected Nigeria, which then lets you see all 31 of the repositories that are listed for them. So it looks to be a potentially useful resource in that regard. Now I wanna look at three scenarios where OA might be an issue. In the first scenario, we'll say you have funds that cover the article processing charges if you wanted to make the article accessible to readers immediately upon publication. There are a couple of things I wanna to touch on uh, for this scenario. If the funding for the APCs is coming from a grant, make sure you stay alert to the timeline. Uh, given the nature of the research lifecycle, there's a lot that has to happen before you're in a position to publish your findings. Disseminating 
uh, the results comes toward the end of the cycle. And if you're not paying attention, the funding period may run out before the article gets accepted for publication and the APCs need to be paid. So try to manage your time so the clock doesn't run out on you. The other point is also related to APCs. If you're getting a discount on APCs or they're being waived by the journal, be sure to know all of the rules around receiving the discount or waiver and make sure you meet all of those criteria. Um, for example, many times waivers are available to authors from low income countries. And while you might qualify for the waiver, be sure to also check the policy to see whether co-author affiliations might affect eligibility. In the second scenario, you're publishing the results of a study that was funded by an organization that has a public access mandate. That is, they require you to make the article freely available to the public. In that case, you need to find out the specific requ uh, requirements that must be met. Do they allow for an embargo period? If so, how much time do they allow? Is there a particular repository you must use? You also need to bear all of that in mind when you're choosing a journal in which to publish. <laughs> Make sure that the journal's policies on public access do not conflict with what you need to do to comply with your funder's requirements. Uh, another point uh, I want to make is that when you're receiving funding, you might be able to include the APCs as part of the budget um, and, and publish gold OA. But bear in mind that the article will be me made freely available in a repository because of the public access mandate. So weigh uh, whether it's worth what you would spend for gold OA um, and what exactly you're buying that green OA isn't providing to you and is it worth the, uh, the expense. Then the last scenario I want to cover uh, here, you'd like to make an article open access, but there isn't any money available. It was unfunded research. Your institution doesn't have any funds for publications and you don't qualify for any fee waivers. One option here is to publish your article in a subscription-based journal at no cost and then self-archive the accepted manuscript in your institutional repository, again, at no cost. Uh, another option is to find a free OA journal and publish there. I will say in my experience, uh, the free OA journals are harder to find. You can search DOAJ and limit the results to journals without fees. Or you might opt to forego open access and just publish in a subscription-based journal. In that case, I recommend trying to find a journal that is widely available in many libraries, so it's um, still relatively accessible to many readers, uh, either because their own library owns the journal, or they can easily get the article through interlibrary loan. You can search WorldCat to find items from libraries around the world. Um, here I searched livestock science and limited the search to journals because that's what I was looking for. 
and it shows that the journal is available in 941 libraries within 200 miles of my location. And it lists those libraries. So from that search, I can see the journal is readily available. So even if it was a subscription-based journal and you had not paid for open access of your article, readers could still likely access your article fairly easily. Another resource to look at uh, is Research for Life. They make journals and other resources freely available to Group A countries, which are in blue on the map, and they provide low-cost access to the Group A countries here in orange. You can check here to see whether the journals you're considering, uh, considering publishing in are among the ones that are made freely available. Note that Research for Life only lists journals that are in DOAJ. The subscription-based journals are not included here. The last resource that I want to mention for finding research papers for free is Unpaywall. Uh, it's a browser extension that can be added if you're using uh, Chrome or Firefox. It gathers full text articles from thousands of university and government websites. These are articles that were legally uploaded with permission from publishers. And Unpaywall says that users read 52% of research papers for free. When you find a paywall paper that is available through Unpaywall, uh, there'll be a green tab on the screen and you just click on that to read the free copy in their database. If the article is not available through Unpaywall, this tab will be gray. So we've talked about some of the reasons you might want to choose OA. Now let's touch on some potential concerns. I think the most obvious uh, are the high fees that are often associated with making an article open access. Many authors are not in a position to pay high APCs. So some journals will be beyond their reach. While waivers might be available to authors from some countries, many do not qualify. So this can, it can make publishing gold OA cost prohibitive for many authors. Another concern around open access are the predatory journals that take advantage of this model. These are journals that make false claims, lack transparency, deviate from best practices, and or use aggressive solicitation practices. Predatory journals pose two problems I want to highlight. Uh, one is that some, some people think that all OA journals are predatory journals. Uh, they think those terms are synonymous. So they view all OA articles with skepticism. That that's more of an issue in some fields than others. Some fields have many well-respected journals with OA options. But in fields where that is not as prevalent, uh, if you've chosen to make your article open access, you may need to explain to some people that it, it was Yes, it was an open access journal, but it was not a predatory journal. 
and then another issue related to the, the predatory thing is that um, if you're going to be publishing in an open access journal, you're going to need to take extra care to make sure it's not one of the predatory journals. And I'm not going to go deeply into this topic. Um, we covered, we did a whole session on this in the previous series. So if you want more information, uh, I would refer you to that session. Here, I'm just going to highlight a few points. First, I want to address why it's important for authors to avoid submitting manuscripts to predatory journals. And uh, for one thing, some would argue that intentionally publishing in a predatory journal in order to avoid peer review is a form of research misconduct. And at best, it's viewed as a questionable practice. And even unintentionally publishing in a predatory journal is problematic. Predatory journals are not likely to have the same reach as well-known established journals, and that can negatively affect the impact um, of an article published in a predatory journal. The International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, uh, ICMJE, explicitly recommends against citing articles that were published in predatory journals. So these articles are gonna be less likely to be cited. Also publishing in predatory journals can harm an author's reputation. Predatory journals typically publish anything if uh, the fee is paid and the articles may be published without undergoing proper peer review, which could have improved the article. Also, the predatory journals often lack proper editorial services. So those two things, the lack of peer review, the lack of proper editorial services could mean that um, an article published there ends up being a lower quality than it would have been if you had chosen a different journal where your article was improved by comments by peer reviewers and um, it was well presented because it had undergone the, the proper editorial services. Another thing to consider is that authors, other, other researchers, um, if they see that an author is published in a predatory journal, they may wonder if that author was duped by the journal or if they intentionally published there because it was easier um, or because they couldn't get the article published in a reputable journal. So overall, the lack of proper peer review and quality control can lead to the publication of articles that are reporting questionable findings and unsupported conclusions, and that can weaken the scientific record. So it's, it's not just the effects it might be having on you and one particular article, uh, but the, the broader implications should be considered. So one tool that can help differentiate predatory from trusted journals is think, check, submit. 
They've got a checklist of questions to ask when you're assessing an article, and that checklist is available in multiple languages. You can see some of their checklist questions touch on things that we've already discussed. Um, many of them deal with the COPE principles of transparency and best practice in scholarly publishing that we covered in depth in a uh, previous session. This is so things such as clear statements regarding the peer review process, transparent publication fees, uh, policies regarding conflicts of interest. They specifically ask whether the publisher is a member in COPE or other recognized initiatives. And if you'll recall, these were involved in developing the, the COPE principles. So I've included those slides here too, just for, um, for easy reference. Um, I won't, uh, due to time, uh, I'm not going to, to cover these in depth uh, again, but I just wanted the, them here um, so they're easy reference if you do want to refer to them when you're considering their application for helping you sort out predatory from um, respected journals. I think this can, um, referring back to these can serve as a nice supplement to the Think Check Submit checklist. So in this session, we discussed open access journals, the differences between gold and green OA, and the pros and cons of open access publishing. Making articles freely available um, reduces barriers to readers so the work may reach more people and have greater impact. On the other hand, making an article free to readers often requires the authors to pay a large fee. Uh, Gold OA can be prohibitively expensive. But green OA is usually a viable option, but again, always check to see what your journal allows um, if OA is important to you. And then I've um, also included uh, links to relevant resources. So I will turn it back to Nargiza. Thank you, Terry. This was a uh... Uh, really, really informative session. I just checked the chat box and um, I do not see any questions. So because we have a very small group of participants, I would invite um, anyone who would like to ask a question to unmute themselves and um, ask the presenter directly. Anyone have a question? I would like Dr. Self to go over something that uh, she covered uh, uh, to cover something more in detail. And I will say if there are no questions and if if you think it would be helpful, I can go back at the the slides at the end that I didn't cover. I I could um I could elaborate on those if you think that would be helpful too. So whatever whatever works for people. Anyone have a question? I do not see any reaction, Terry. So let's go back to those slides that where you can provide a little bit more information maybe. Okay. So this was where we were talking about predatory journals and that uh, Think, Check, Submit has an excellent checklist, but you could go back to the principles of transparency and best practice in scholarly publishing that we talked about in, I think, all the way back to our first session and have repeatedly seen, um, and use it 
here too. Um, so these cope principles clearly lay out the things that journals should be doing and should not be doing. So you can check to see if the journal you're considering is following these best practices. Uh, for example, look to see if the website uh, displays an ISSN. That, and that came up uh, in a previous slide, um, the, the idea of the ISSN. There are the other things, uh, for example, um, for ISSN, there's a site called ISSN.org where you can, you can look up that ISSN. So just because the journal says they're doing something, you also want to verify the information. Um, so you could look up the ISSN and, and make sure that what they say they have, they actually have. Um, if you look up one of these pieces of information and it doesn't check out, that's clearly an indication <laughs> that the journal may have questionable practices. So other information that you might look at, um, they should have information on the, the governing body and the editorial team. They should clearly state any publication fees as well as their copyright and licensing policies. They should indicate their plan for article access in the event that the journal is no longer published. In addition, sources of revenue, advertising policies, and direct marketing activities need to be stated. And journals are expected to take reasonable steps to avoid publishing papers where research misconduct has occurred. They should have policies on publishing ethics, which are clearly visible. So policies on things like authorship and conflicts of interest. Their publishing schedule should be clearly stated, as should any pay-per-view fees required for authors to access articles, uh, for readers um, to access articles. So being more familiar with these principles should make it easier for you to assess journals. And going back to this, uh, kind of using it as a checklist can be helpful when you're, you're actually looking at a journal and trying to decide if it's um, a place you want to publish your article. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Terry. Mm -hmm. Any questions? I do not see any questions, nor you are welcome to unmute and ask your question. Okay, I do not see any questions, nor well, we'll take see it as anyone. a good sign. <laughs> yeah, must be, yes. <laughs> then uh, we are very close to the uh, to 9 a.m. So we could uh, close this webinar. Uh, before we close officially, I'd like to share information about our next webinar, which will be on December 1st. Um, at the same time, and you can use the same link. Uh, these uh, webinars 
webinar will be focused on being expensive, sharing my work in ways I may not have considered. And in this webinar, we will talk about uh, ways you can share your research results uh, in um, other types of publication uh, to disseminate your work and also the ethical considerations that you make you may take into account as you spread your work with wider audiences. We hope to see you next time. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, goodbye. And thank you, Terry. Oh, you're very welcome. I hope it was helpful. I'm sure it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.